Okay. Okay. I should know this. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you so much for inviting me, and also to this um, um, to the trip up to uh, Nickel and um, and uh, Chirkenes uh, earlier, which of course made a huge impression. Uh, this image here uh, is from New York. And it's in connection with, uh, I was invited to the Guggenheim Museum to, uh, and the Unsound Festival to listen in to the underwater and sound uh, environment situation there. And uh, this image kind of sums up a bit uh, to me, you know, what we leave behind of, uh, what shall I say, ruins. And um, it sort of struck me when we then came to uh, Nickel which this image is from. But yeah, this is pretty similar. And as I was looking through the images from Mikkel, I was thinking I've seen all this before. So I was actually in old cities. I and mean, I was here, you know, it was just more hidden than it was in Nickel. Because when you come there, you have the open landscape and you have the factory, which is like the center of this, uh, uh, of it. And um, it's kind of spewing out this smoke. No. And after being there, I've seen so many pipes <laughs> spewing out smoke, and I really don't know what's coming out of it. You know, so here it's like you're told it's one factory, it's all there, it's just really bad, and it's hard to breathe. Uh, but we have it everywhere. You know, we're leaving this all over the place. And, but also what's fascinating to me, not just this kind of ruins that we leave behind, but this stuff which we, we then are drifting off with the wind and we don't know where it's going. And it will essentially drop down somewhere with uh, this um, sulfur dioxide, for example, coming out of this, um, this one particular one. Um, it will drop down somewhere and it's taking another shape. You know, we, create, we take this out of the earth and it comes into another form. Um, and here, the, um, that was when the smog had lifted up from uh, Nickel, so you can look over to Norway, and it's really not very far. Uh, and you see the, uh, the Pacific uh, River um, further in the background there. And uh, this piece I'm doing tonight is called Pacific Dal, which is from that area. It's really on the border between Norway and Russia, and it actually is the border. Um, and in Kirkenes, um, it's a great kind of positive vibe there, I felt, that it's very enthusiastic about that we're, you know, there's some oil coming. And it's already they're preparing for oil to come from Russia, from land um, drilled oil, to be re um, put into larger boats here. They were preparing to open this the week after we were there. Um, so, and all these areas, areas there has been prepared to, uh, to open up for more drilling in the Barren Sea. Um, and also what I find really worrying is like the, our former prime minister, Stoltenberg, he, he wrote this kind of new agreement between Russia and Norway on a, a handkerchief thing, or what do you call it, like, not a handkerchief, but a serviette, very quickly. This happened like, without really any discussion, and the whole my life, this has been a question about the area, the gray zone between Norway and Russia in the sea. And I think this is all about, you know, they, they were planning to start opening up new fields. Uh, in, um, in this area, and very recently, they're now talking about moving the ice, sea ice edge further north, because there's been a law that you can't drill for oil too close to the sea ice edge, because we're, um, you know, if there is an accident there, there's no way to get the oil off or up from, uh, you know, from the sea. Uh, and all this is sort of happening, and you know, it's, uh, it's actually really worrying. So, um, 
So, yeah, I won't say more about this, but it's also struck me that it becomes a lot to do with time, you know, and then in times are changing a lot, even in my lifetime, I've seen, you know, political changes and it's, it's happening pretty fast. But another project I'm working on is in, uh, <clears throat> in Gotland. I'm going there, uh, I was there right after or before, after uh, Nicole. Um, and this is sort of another type of statue, which is 400 million years old. And because uh, Gotland used to lie on the equator. And this is all created by corals and shells and, you know, uh, over so, 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 so many years ago. So it gives you kind of perspective of time. But then again, we make factories to make this process faster, to grind this faster. <laughs> so that this is also in Gotland. Uh, I'm going there to do an installation over the summer in this area. And this connects again to a project I work on, which is called Silencing of the Reef. And this is a reef in the um, Dominican Republic at the Silver Bank, uh, where I was to record uh, sound on this reef in relation to uh, whether the coral could grow back. Uh, the coral here, it uh, died in the 80s out of white band disease. Uh, that was actually a bacterial infection that came in and killed everything because the um, biodiversity isn't very big there. So <clears throat> um, we invited um, a team with Ruben Torres and um, Alessandro um, um, uh, Alvarez. To, uh, he's an underwater photographer, so this, un all the underwater photographs uh, in this, pr this presentation is by him. This is Ruben, where he's measuring up uh, areas to look for different species, if anything is kind of growing back, and whether the illegal fishing which is happening in the area is influencing this growing back of the coral or not. And why it's so extremely important that this coral is growing back is that it keeps it um, a good environment for the humpback whales to come and give birth. So um, they travel all the way from the Nordic uh, uh, up here, not further north, I mean, up by Kirkenes and, and um, Greenland and uh, all these northern areas to, uh, to come to these warm waters to give birth to their calves. Um, because if they gave birth up north, they would get pneumonia. You know? uh, so these reefs makes it a very good place for them to, to be. And if these are now breaking down more and more, um, it's not for like you know, hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of years. These have been coming there because of this preferable situation. Now I'm rambling on. I will play you a sound. Um, for example, in around the reef, this toadfish lives. You can see. So what I do, I go there and record the sound to hear whether there is like uh, more or less sound um, in the different uh, reef areas. So you can hear the whir, 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 and that is the toadfish. And it's not very uh, visible, it's just uh, very audible. In the Norwegian fjords, we also have uh, fish, and they come in, um, I mean, fish that are audible, <laughs> uh, speci specifically uh, cod and, um, and Norwegian pollock. And they particularly speak when they are in the, in the spawning season. PowerPoint, right.
yeah, you get the points. But the problem in the, there in the, on the silver bank is the illegal fishing that happens. And, um, but it's not very easy to come through you know, on this kind of pretty luxurious boat and say to people, you know, you can't do this because you, it's the only way to make a living. And there's most incredible divers with so strong bodies that can actually manage to dive up and down like eight hours uh, up and down on the ocean, spearfishing everything. Um, but still, the parrotfish that they are collecting is the one that are really good at eating off algae from the coral, so that the coral, the new coral larvae, can find somewhere to settle. And God, it's such a huge production. Okay, this is a coral. They are, you know, quite small. <laughs> and Ruben was collecting um, sp uh, samples um, of the coral that he, uh, we brought them back to the coral nurseries at the Dominican Republic, where they breed them to uh, grow, and then they plant them out different uh, genotypes so that they can be stronger for a possible new attack of a whatever white band disease or other things. The thing is that the problem is that this, if the stress factors on these areas becomes too many, I mean, that's also like how much can you take within a certain amount of time? Um, so it's again, you know, a question about, about time and amount of stress factors. Um, I'll show you a couple of installations that I do have done with this um, type of sounds. This one were in Istanbul in 2010. Uh, the piece I did was called Between Dry Land. Um, and this is a sculpture by Matthew Ritchie. I was invited by Russell Haswell. Um, and it was a commission from Tyson Bonamisa, our contemporary. Within the structure, there is like 50 speakers. And I had sort of underwater environments um, within the structures. So you can kind of walk around in the underwater sounds. Um, a kind of, it's because this structure kind of reminded me a bit about the, 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 the creatures you find underwater. I will jump this because we don't have that much time. Uh, this is a very recent piece I did in, um, in New York uh, this summer um, where I had eight um, envi underwater environments um, all through the tunnel. So the public can kind of walk through from shallow waters to deeper waters. I'll play, this is when I'm going to play you an example of this. It becomes a bit absurd to play it out of two speakers. And uh, it's just <laughs> because this were like all surrounding you, groups of eight speakers and two subs, um, eight times through the tunnel. But anyway, you get an impression.
Yes, I just have to tell you about this. You heard a humpback whale there, and I just have to tell you. They come back to the Silver Bank and they make a new song, which has a development within 40 minutes. And this song is a new one every, every year. I just think it's amazing. How do they actually learn it? You know, and they all sing the same song, but it's different every year. Um, you also heard the kind of, uh, kind of this kind of electric sound of the... Um, uh, of the dolphins that are uh, echolocating. And there's something I'm also interested in, you know, this stuff which we don't really quite understand, you know, how can they actually get so much information with their echolocation and all can kind of see through sound. And another creature that we all know that does this is uh, the bats, you know. And uh, this one is a bulldog bat that I was uh, recording on the same, oh, that was not the same trip, I was in Panama, this was. Um, uh, later on, and um, I want to play. How am I doing for time? Didn't follow. Okay, I have enough time. So um, I play how they sound like when they are fishing. If you see, uh, no, there, it's the fish that this uh, is echolocating to, uh, to get. So I could see how they were kind of echolocating and then, because I couldn't hear them except with my uh, Petersholm's ultrasound detector. And uh, then they grab the fish because they can echolocate and find the slight movements in the water and recognize that from another wave, which I find fascinating. So I play you what they sound like. Slow down then, obviously. <laughs> So I used uh, this sound, which is, was great for me because it was they were breaking the surface of the water, so I could uh, use them as kind of having them around. And this this is for an installation at MoMA in 2013. So they were flying around your head, going through the water surface, and right under the water surface, I had recordings of underwater insects and fish. So I created this, um, and I work very often with Tony Myatt that uh, does this um, uh, the, um, programming and making the maximum SP patches for me um, for the distribution of the sound. Uh, you can see him there uh, within the 16 speaker setup. So there's another example and ex extract of, of this installation again then in two speakers. Um, come on. There. You can hear the bats. They almost sound like birds when they slow down somehow. Thank you. 
stop that. So that, yeah, going back to um, Poswick Doll, which uh, I'll play uh, tonight. And uh, this is from uh, from Poswick Doll. And, you know, it's, it's so many issues. It's like, it's so much to take in, what's happening and sort of out of our control. And I, I suddenly get this kind of urge just to lie down in the grass and just look like, and listen to the small creatures. And I, you know, like, for example, this one. Uh, this is, uh, we call it Tordivel, or the dung beetle in English, I think. And uh, I remember I was up uh, in the forest trying to kind of photograph him and uh, sort of moving him around to make him pose for me, you know. And he got so scared, he sort of tried to dig himself down into the ground, of course. And I was so kind of clumsy. So I just, okay, calm down and let him go. <laughs> and uh, so then I came back a bit later and uh, I was... Um, I managed to kind of get to say hello in the proper way. And then I could see that he was like doing this kind of movement. When I started to focus on this really small stuff, I could see what he was doing. So I think we just, you know, they've been around much longer than us. Um, as this also underwater insect, I will, um, in the end, play you. I really love this little creature. It's the loudest um, according to size as far as we know. Uh, I don't know if it's exact this species, um, but they use stridulation uh, to make sound with, and uh, the loudest according to size. The blue whales obviously are the loudest and largest. So I'll end by playing you the sound of this underwater insect. Okay, thank you for listening and hope to see you again tonight.